Uh, I'm uh, Nate Thompson. I'm one of the pastors here at Southside Bible Church, and I want to welcome any guests that we might have, and, and thank you for joining us, and we pray that you sense the love of Christ in this place, and a love for His Word, love for His people, and a love for a dying world. So if you would, go ahead and join me in prayer, and we'll get started. God, this is your church, and this is your word, and we pray that you're glorified in it this morning. Uh, would you speak? It's your name we pray. Amen. The great detective Sherlock Holmes and his assistant, Dr. Watson, went on a camping trip, and as they lay down for the night, Sherlock Holmes said, Watson, look up into the sky and tell me what you see. Dr. Watson said, I see millions and millions of stars. And Sherlock Holmes then asked, and what does that tell you, Watson? And Dr. Watson responded, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Theologically, it tells me that God is great and that we are small and insignificant by comparison. Meteorologically, it tells me that we'll have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it tell you, Holmes? Sherlock Holmes paused and said, Dr. Watson, it tells me that somebody has stole our tent. <laughs> so sometimes we just miss what's right in front of us, right? And we've been going through the book of Romans, and we have had a chance to deep dive into some deep, uh, issues regarding sanctification, the Holy Spirit. And what I wanted to do is take this opportunity while Ken's taking a little bit of a break and, and kind of fill in some of those questions that might have arisen through all of the things that we have been covering. So this morning, just the sermon title will be Five C's to, the grow, to Growth in Christ. Five C's to Growth in Christ. Not the five C's to growth in Christ. There are many, many. I'm just going to hit five things this morning. So here's your outline. It's pretty simple. Coming to Christ. Control of the Spirit. Continuing in love. Confession of sin. Counting on forgiveness. Okay? So very simple. Keep your Bibles handy. We're going to be all over it this morning. So... Without further ado, your first C, coming to Christ, and your question might be, why, we're talking about sanctification, why are we starting here? Because we must start here. Everyone must start here in coming to Christ. If I miss this, if I miss coming to Christ, then sanctification is pretty useless, kind of like a styrofoam submarine. Doesn't serve its purpose, Okay. So, if you would, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6, and we'll be looking at verses 35 to 40. Verses 35 to 40. John 6, verses 35 to 40. It says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. The one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise him up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So um, what I want to focus on is that second part of verse 37. That first part is a great theological concept. It's called election. But we're talking about salvation and coming to Christ. And it's where we're getting our theme for this heading. And it says, the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. That's what it says in the NAS translation. And it's very emphatic in the Greek, the original text. It says, no, not cast out. I won't cast out. So the question is not whether or not I'm elect, it's whether or not I want to come. 
If you want to come, come. Because his arms are wide open. Come. Because he says, if you come, he won't cast you out. So it does beg the question, how do I come? What does that look like? So if you would, I'm going to flip over to Romans 10. I know I said Romans. Shh. Don't tell Ken. We're going to do Romans 10, and we'll look at verses 8 through 10. Romans 10, verses 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we're preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. Now, this verse is so pregnant with meaning, it's triplets. It's heavy. There's so much to it. I want us to focus on what it's saying. First thing it says is, if you confess with your mouth. And the second thing it says, if you believe in your heart. So what's confessed and then what's believed in? So what's confessed? And the Greek word is, uh, for confess is this word homo legeo. And we'll see this again through our uh, study. But homo legeo, homo same, legeo, to say. So it's to say the same thing. It's an agreement term. Okay? And so who are we in agreement with? We're in agreement with God about who Jesus is. And who is Jesus? He's Lord. Kurios. Lord. What's that mean? What's Lord mean? Well, absolute ruler. Absolute ruler. Now, the, the question in the context is, do I need to admit that he's the absolute ruler over all things? Not really. It's that he's the absolute ruler over me. He's the absolute ruler over me. In order for me to come to Christ, I see him as my Lord. He rules me. And it says, with a mouth that's confessed. And then it says, and he believes in his heart that God raised Jesus. God, the Father, raised Jesus from the dead. Massive theological implications. Here's the thing. Um, It's important that God raised Jesus from the dead. Why? Because our sin is what separated us from God. And so the debt that was owed was owed to God for our sin. So whatever happened, God needed to say, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. And that is exactly what happened at the resurrection. God said, what happened on that cross? I'm satisfied. Stamp of approval, resurrection. So why just the resurrection? Why aren't we talking about the cross? Why aren't we talking about his life? Why aren't we talking about all the other aspects? Because the resurrection validates and implies all the rest. You don't have a resurrection without a burial. You don't have a burial without a death. You don't have a death without a life. You don't have a life without a birth. So it's implicating all of it, and it validates all of it. And it says we must believe, pistos, faith, have absolute faith. And it's not faith into, it's not this intellectual ascent. It's not just, I, you know, I, 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 can, I realize that Jesus was raised from the dead and, and all of that stuff. No, it's to believe. And to believe is to take everything I've got and invest it in one thing. And that one thing is Jesus Christ. Now, how do I know that it's that weight of an implication? If you read 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 19, I'm not going to go there, but write it down. It tells us if there's no resurrection, we're of all men most to be pitied. We're hopeless. We're without hope. If you found out that Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, would you be ruined? Would it ruin you, or would it simply inconvenience you? Well, that didn't work. On to the next thing. No. This is what belief in Christ is. I invest everything in that one thing. That one thing is Christ, and his finished work on the cross and what he has done. 
That's what I've got it all writing on. So it's important that I call him Lord. Now, you might be sitting here and saying, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't know I was supposed to say Jesus is Lord when I, when I came to faith. That's okay. I'm just going to ask you this one question. Right now, is that what is crying out in your heart? Jesus is Lord. He is risen from the dead. Jesus is Lord. He is ruler of my life. He rules me. Is that what's in your heart? Amen. Amen. So Christ calls us to come to him. And the door is open. And the door to the ark is open right now. Come in. Come in and be saved. And if you already know this, it's, it's never a bad day to review it and to have it afresh in my mind. That he is my Lord. He rules my life. He's good. So that brings us to the next thing, our next C, the control of the Spirit. Okay, how does that bring us to the next thing? Well, when I come to Christ, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to indwell me. And there's many passages we could look at. I'll just give you a few and comment on one of them, Acts 2.38, Romans 8, 9, and 11, 1 Corinthians 3.16, 1 Corinthians 6.19, Galatians 4.6, and 2 Timothy 1.4. I want to just comment on Acts 2.38. This is Peter giving the gospel, and the people say, what must we do? What must we do to be saved? And he said, repent, believe, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's our... That's our engagement ring, the, the Holy Spirit, the, our assurance that Christ is coming for us, his, his bride. And he comes to indwell us. And if you read all of these passages, when he indwells us, he will never leave us. You will never lose the Holy Spirit. You will always have him. So it's important to create a delineation then, because might say in, in your mind, well, what about sin? Good. You're asking the right question. That's the implications of the control of the Spirit. It's different than the indwelling. If I twist both of these things up, I'm going to end up with a really weird idea that somehow every time I sin, I lose the Holy Spirit. When I repent, he comes back, back and forth, back and forth. It's not the way this works. The Holy Spirit is always there, is always resident in our lives. The control of the Spirit is a different idea. So uh, Pastor Joel read for us uh, John 15. And so let's turn there now to John 15 because there's a lot of implications to this passage. I'm going to focus in on verses 7 through 11. It says, If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and I, it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands, abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be full in you and that your joy may be made full. So there's, there's this thought of abiding in Christ. And notice it says two things. It says, abide in me and I in you. Well, how is it that Christ abides in us? By the work of his spirit. He abides in us. He's there. He's resident. How do I abide in him? How do I? And that, that word means to, to dwell, to, to walk with, to be with. That's abiding. Okay? And then, then we get this other thought of... Um, uh, as I'm abiding in him, there will be much fruit produced. Well, that's consistent with Galatians 5, and 23, where it says the fruit of the Spirit, that means what the Spirit produces is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, self-control. Okay, that's the fruit of the Spirit. So as he's in me and I'm abiding in him, that's, that's the thought we're going to flesh out. 
His fruit, the, spirit, the Spirit's fruit, is produced in my life. So all of these thoughts are consistent with what God promised. Abide in me, and, and, and we're going to get to another thought, and that is um, abide in my love. Or that's going to be our third C. We're going to look at that more succinctly. So it does beg the question, so what does it mean to be controlled by the Spirit? What does that mean? Okay, so remember, separate the idea of indwelling from control. Okay, if I don't, I'm going to end up in some really frustrating thoughts. Okay, Galatians 5.16 uses the language, walk by the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 uses the language, be filled with the Spirit. So walking is something we do one step at a time. So there's this thought of a moment by moment. So something's going on moment by moment. And this indicates that. And then this being filled indicates a definite state. I am or I'm not, right? There's, there's no half full. Um, think of the filling of the spirit, which is the thought of the control of the spirit, more like being pregnant. Ladies, are you ever kind of pregnant? From the giggles, I take it, no, right? You either are or you're not, right? Pregnant or I'm not pregnant. That's the way that is, okay? You might not know that you're pregnant, but if you are, you are. There's, that's it, period. So it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. So if my heart is, is trusting and yielding to the prompting of the Spirit, that's what it is to be controlled. So there's an active aspect to this, and what I don't want us to be confused about is when we're talking about battling sin or the power over sin, that's the power of the Spirit. He is, is able, He's the one that can do that. If you go up toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with your flesh and say, I got this, you've already failed. The Spirit has the power. That's where the power comes from, okay, over sin. Victory over sin is in the Spirit, right? In Romans 8, read about, if you are putting to death by the Spirit, by the Spirit, okay? So it's Him. Now, is it just, as Ken has said, is it just let go and let God? Is this some kind of mystic, Buddhistic, uh, you know, wah, let my, you know, empty your thoughts? That's not it. There's an active trusting and yielding to the Spirit. What does He want? Okay. So what is, go what is the Spirit going to lead me into? Well, according to John, 13, uh, John 16, 13 to 14, the Spirit will lead us into all the truth. Whose truth? God's truth. And according to 2 Peter 1, who wrote the Word of God? All Scripture is God-breathed. There you go. And uh, the Spirit moved men to write the Word. So the Holy Spirit of God in all believers will always agree with the Word of God. So how do I know that what, what I think is the leadings of the Spirit, how do I know objectively that is, that is the desire of the Spirit? It's always going to be consistent with the Word of God. Always the objective truth of God. It will agree. If there's disagreement, it's not the Spirit of God. So in Ephesians uh, 4.30, we are told, commanded not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God to whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. What grieves God? What grieves God? Sin does. That's right, sin does. So a desire for sin, is that consistent with the control of the Spirit? Negative. No, it's not. So if I am desiring sin or embracing sin, that's, that's inconsistent with the control of the Spirit can't be controlled by the Spirit. Galatians 5. 
flip to that. Um, verses 13 to 18. We've got several passages there that help us. Galatians 5, 13 to 18. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care, so you're not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under law. Meaning, there's, what compels me? It's not a list of rules. It's God in me. And it's a love for God, and it's clearly a love for others. The Spirit will never lead us to sin. Love fulfills the law, and we walk in that love. We'll have a desire to serve one another, and we'll be driven to obedience out of love. And in Ephesians 5, 18 through 20 and Colossians 3, 16, we are controlled by the Spirit as we are speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. Hopefully you're seeing that this morning. And as we sing from our hearts to the Lord, and as we, get this, give thanks for all things, even the hard stuff. We give thanks for all things. The Spirit will lead us to give thanks for all things. Why? Romans 8.28. For God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love Him, for those who are called according to His purpose. If that's true, then I can give thanks for all things. Because whatever it is, God's at work, and it's good. Because He's good. So I hope that helps with the control of the Spirit. What is it? Trusting and yielding to Him. Trusting and yielding to Him. Do I always do it? No, unfortunately. I wish that I did. But He is able to uphold me. And we'll talk about what do I do when I find that I'm not controlled by the Spirit. So I want us to move on now to this Third point, continuing in love. So let's recall that in John 15, 9, we're commanded to abide or remain in God's love. So it begs the question, what is God's love? Right? So that I know whether or not I'm abiding in it. Um, it's, it's called out in 1 Corinthians 13. And for some of you who might say, hmm, 1 Corinthians 13, that's for weddings. Um, that's not for us and sanctification. You're wrong. The context of 1 Corinthians 13, get this. 1 Corinthians 12 comes before 1 Corinthians 13. And 1 Corinthians 14 comes after 1 Corinthians 13 thus developing what is called a context. Okay? Here's the thing. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is reprimanding the church of Corinth. You're, you're just chest-thumping about how good your gifts are. And you're doing it wrong. And he gets on them and says, the reason why you're doing it wrong is because you're missing one important aspect. There's no love in what you're doing. There's no desire to build up one another. You just want to build yourselves up. You are completely missing it. So when we're jumping into the context of 1 Corinthians 13, it's on the coattails of a reprimand, not on the coattails of happy smiley, this is a wedding. 1 Corinthians 14 then talks about, now that you've got it right, now I'm going to tell you about how to actually use those spiritual gifts. Okay? So it's cohesive, and it's emphatic that 1 Corinthians 13 has a point. 
And that point is to tell us and to answer the question that they were asking, okay, then what is the love of God? Well, we get it. So 1 Corinthians 13 starts with, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Ever wonder why it's starting there? Because 1 Corinthians 12, they were saying, my gift of tongues is so great, I'm such a great person. So he starts here by saying, okay, let me pick up what you think is so great, and I'm going to tell you how great it is. If I speak with the tongues and hyperbolically of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Whiff, you missed it. If I have the gift of prophecy, another one in 1 Corinthians 12 that they were all hung up on, and know all mysteries, add to that. I know everything there is to know. I understand everything there is to know about the Scripture. And I have all knowledge. Gnosko, I know it. And if I have all faith, wow, wow. So as to remove mountains. Didn't Jesus talk about that? Yes. But do not have love. I am nothing. And that should hit us all like a ton of bricks. Whoa. And if I give my possessions to feed the poor, what philanthropic kindness that is. If I surrender my body to be burned. Isn't that the ultimate? To be a martyr? But do not have love. It profits me nothing. That's a big miss. This is huge. So it it urges the reader then to say, then what's love? This sounds important. Because it is important. What is love? Paul goes into it, and it's agape, that's the Greek word, it's patient, how much of the time? All the time. Towards who? Everyone. Even my enemies? Yes. Love is kind. How much of the time? All of the time. To who? Everyone. Even my enemies? Yes. It's not jealous. How much of the time? All of the time. You get it? Love does not brag and is not arrogant. No one in here ever struggles with these things. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. These four I want to put together because I want you to think about the current state of our country. They are, because it says, it doesn't act unbecomingly. That means it doesn't seek to provoke. It doesn't seek its own. It's not self-centered, and and literally in the Greek, um, it doesn't look to itself in earnest. It's not provoked. That's in and of itself. It can't be sharpened or pushed to being um, angry, being offended, and it doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. In the Greek, it's four words. No, taking account the evil. Love it because it acknowledges that what was done to me was evil. And yet I'm called to forgive. Why? Think about what you and I are forgiven. That's why. Okay? And so think about that in the context of our nation. Are we not provoked? Are we not provoking Are we not self-centered? Are we bitter and unforgiving? Absolutely. Here's what's worse. It's in the church. And we say it's no big deal. And yet Christ says, they will know, you will know, the world will know you're my disciples by how smart you are with the Bible. No. The world will know that you're my disciples by your agape love for one another. Right? And and if we're not this to one another, how much less to the world? 
Should, should we be provoked? Should we be provoking? Should we be about ourselves? Should we be bitter and unforgiving? And it's in the church. And, and yet we're called to continue in this love. John 15, abide in my love. And we put this aside like it's something small. And it's monumentally huge. And we're not even done with the list. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It's it's not satisfied to look out at the world and say, that's evil, and make fun of them or, or cast them aside. It doesn't, it's not happy about that. It rejoices instead in the truth. Then you get to the real stuff. It bears all things. That means to to bear up under, to take any amount of pressure. It can take any amount of pressure and still maintain. It bears all things. It believes all things. This isn't gullibility. This means it believes the absolute best about everyone and everything until something contradicts that. So I never assume the worst. It assumes the best. It it hopes all things. It's hopeful. It's full of hope. Do, Do you see how that projects out into the God of the universe who's in control of all things? I can have hope because he knows what he's doing and he loves me and he's in control of it. I can have hope. I can hope. Don't hope in this life. Don't hope in this America. Hope in Christ. It's a sure hope. So it hopes all things. And then it endures all things. Put that alongside of that bears. That endures as it can keep on going. Energizer bunny, it never stops. It's amazing. And and here's the thing, all of these, this attribute list, this list of 14, it's all together in one package. It's in one package all together. That means all of these things need to be coexistent for it to actually be love. I can't do the 80% rule. I'm a pretty patient person, not very kind, but I'm not jealous and I don't brag. So, I'm good. Okay? This is, you get 100% or a zero. Now, does that bring us to a place of saying, that is impossible. That's impossible. I can't do this. Good, you're you're barking up the right tree. So it leaves us with two options. Either it is possible somehow, or God's a good manipulator, where he sets a standard, and he really wants us here, so he sets the standard here and hopes that we jump here. God's not a manipulator. That's wrong. So there must be some way that this is possible, and it connects to our first point. The control of the Spirit. If, if I dial myself back to Galatians 5.22, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love. It is possible. It's possible in and by and through the Spirit. So why this, why this list? Well, I'll just do my best to try and do this list. No, you're, that's not going to work. All you're doing is taking this list and just turning it into law. It won't work. It won't work. This list is here because it's absolute objective truth that's an indicator of where our hearts are at. If I see I'm impatient, if I see I'm unkind, if I see I'm lacking any of these things, it's a, it's a red light on the dashboard of my automobile saying, check engine, check engine. 
And I can solve that problem by pulling over, smashing the light out, and continuing on my merry way. Solve the problem until the engine explodes. How did that happen? Didn't pay attention. No. Or I can say that light is indicating something. That's indicating something about the control of the Spirit. It's indicating something about whether or not I'm truly trusting and abiding in Him. It's an indicator, not a list of rules. And this is what we're called to continue in. So get this, to be absent of love is to be, guess what, disobedient to Christ. It's sin. And it's not walking in control of the Spirit because the Spirit produces this. So that presses a question. What do I do if I find the indicator light on? I'm not loving. I'm not, in, in, uh, I'm, I, I'm not under the control of the Spirit. What do I do? Guess what? Point four, fourth C. Confession of sin. Confession of sin. And here's the thing. Here is what I see as one of the biggest misses in the modern day church. If confession is taught at all, it is taught in the context of a regular prayer life and almost as an afterthought. Even a person with a regular prayer life praying morning, noon, night confesses their sins only three times a day. Well, what if I sin ten times a day? What if I sin... 20 times a day? What if I sin 30 times a day? Do do you see the problem that we're creating is what we're teaching people is deal with your sin on a clock rotation. Do you know what the Bible teaches? Deal with your sin as soon as possible. As soon as possible. So, what is confession of sin? I'm going to start with what it's not. All right? It's not me realizing how much God loves and forgives me. That's not confession. For those of you spouses, check me on this. Let's say you have an interesting conversation with your spouse where your spouse yells, screams, angry, hateful words at you. And then they leave the room, and then they come back in the room with a big smile on their face. And you ask, why the smile? Well, honey, I just realized how much you love and forgive me. So we're good. Yeah, that works. (laughs) Try that after your next fight. See how that goes. That's because there's a big something missing in that, isn't there? Person who really got what I was telling you. Right? There's something missing. There's, There's this heart of apology, right? You're saying, where's the apology? Where's where's this admitting of wrong? You're owning nothing. You're just putting it all on me because I'm loving and merciful and gracious and you're saying we're all good because of who you are. And the thing is, even within yourself, and I'm just giving you a worldly example. I haven't even gotten to the text yet. Something's missing. That's wrong. There's a disconnect there. All right? Now let's go to the text. 1 John 1 We're going to look at verses 8 through 10. It says, If we say that we have fellowship with him, whoops, sorry, that's 6. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, there's our word, and the same one as in uh, earlier as we looked in uh, Romans with Homo Legao. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. 
So what is confession? It's homo legeo, it's to say the same thing. That's agreement. Who am I agreeing with? God about what? My sin. I'm in agreement with God about my sin. He's the one telling me I'm wrong. And, and I'll ask you, is he ever wrong? That's, that's not the problem in, in our relationship. It's not him. It's me. And it's, and it's my sin. And so I'm in agreement with him that I'm wrong. That's what confession is. I agree. And that means I don't like it. I don't want it. I hate it. Same as him. Don't want to go back to it. All of these things are true. That's what confession is. It's, it's not reciting. That's kind of what it is in society when they hear, hear the word confession. They hear reciting of wrong. I did this and I did that and I did the other thing. And the thing is, in, in recitation, you can have zero sincerity in it, right? I was bad, I lied, I said this thing, I had a bad thought. That's not confession. Confession's agreement. I did do this thing. I agree with you. And I agree with you that it's wrong. And I agree with you. I don't want it. I want you. And it's bookended, so we get this if conditional. It's because it's in this flow of if, if conditionals. If we say that we have no sin. If we, if we say we're not a sinner, uh, what we're actually saying is uh, we're delusional. That's, that's what it says. The only person you're fooling is yourself. So you're not fooling anybody else. Everybody else says, what? Yeah. Do you do things wrong? Of course you do. Yeah. So I can't be that, a believer that is. A believer can't be a person who says, I'm not a sinner. And then 10 says, if we say that we have not sinned. And if I wrap the second part of it into it, I get what that's saying. He says, we make him out to be a liar. So it's God saying to us, saying to the person, you've sinned. And the person says back, no, I didn't. And so if I'm saying that, who's the liar? God is, right? I make God the liar. You're lying. I didn't sin. You're saying I'm sinned. You're the liar. And in both of those cases, verse 8 and verse 10, it makes the statement, the truth is not in us or his word is not in us. God's not there. God can't be in a person like that. Now, here's the assurance to you, believer. 1 John 1, 9 is assurance. It's assurance. It says, if we confess, and this is an active verb, okay? It's not one and done. It's not a um, past tense. It's instead a present active tense. So it's a noun continuing thing. It's something that we do. One of the assurances that you are a child of God is that you're convicted of your sin and you want to deal with it. You want to confess it. You want to agree with God. That's assurance. If there is no conviction of sin, or worse, a battle with God telling me I've sinned, that's where you should be concerned about your assurance because the truth is not in you. But if you're convicted, and, and hear me on this statement, guilt is good. I know there's people out there going saying, you are crazy. No, guilt is good because it drives me to do something. Guilt is there as my red light telling me there's sin. Deal with it. Rejoice, believer. Guilt is good because it can come off. And it comes off through Christ. It comes off through our next and last, our last statement, counting on the forgiveness of God. In 1 John 1.9, the second half of that verse, critical, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he's righteous or just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is not a maybe. 
This is factual. If you've come to Christ, you have forgiveness. You're forgiven in Christ. You're forgiven. And one of the struggles that we have as believers is that we doubt that truth. We come and we confess our sins, and then we struggle with believing it to be true. Or we try to make it up to him. Like, at that battle, let me make this up to you. Or we beat ourselves up somehow to, to, to somehow earn that forgiveness. All, all of these are absent of truth. Did you earn your salvation in the first place? Did you earn in any way the forgiveness found in God? I hope that your answer is no. So you cannot earn forgiveness in sanctification either. Don't earn it. Don't doubt it. Believe it. It's true. If I confess, if I am a confessor of my sin, if I come to him, I want to admit my wrong to him. Assurance. And then believe what he says. He's faithful. He never drops the ball. He's faithful to forgive. And it's right for him to forgive. Why is it right? Because it's already paid for. He paid for it. That's why it's right. You don't go try and earning it. Don't mess it up. That's works-based righteousness. Under the veil of some kind of sanctification weirdness. Like I'm, I can earn it. No, no. He gives it. Now, here's, here's, here's a reality that sometimes we do struggle with forgiveness. And do you know what the best medicine against lies are? The best battle against a lie? The truth. So let's fill our minds with the truth. Psalm 32 says... Verse 1 and 2, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man, happy, to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. We're not playing the hide-and-seek game with God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are forgiven. Psalm 130, verse 4. Psalm 130, verse 4. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. There's forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are forgiven. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. In Him, Christ, we have redemption through His blood, Christ, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are forgiven. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving each other. Just as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are forgiven. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcised, uh, uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, all of them 
having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are forgiven. 1 John 2.12 I am writing these things to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for His name's sake. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are forgiven. If you are relying on Christ and Him alone because of Christ, you are forgiven. Let the truth ring in your hearts. So let us dwell here. Let us be controlled by the Spirit. Let us be continually loving. And when we are not, let us confess our sins and let us count on the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ. And let us live there and not waste time in sin, not waste time wallowing, not wasting time trying to make it up to him, but instead confessing and counting, basking and thanking him for the forgiveness that is found in him, that he could only, he's the only one that could do it. And watch that guilt that was there be washed away. So this morning, I I hope you come away with a better, stronger understanding of what it is to continue in Christ, and that it fills in some of those questions that you might have had. If you still have questions, I will be up here after the service. Feel free to come up here with your questions, your comments, or your threats. I welcome them all. J. Sidlow Baxter writes, during the brilliant Victorian days in England, you'll love this, Sean Killian, two great preachers were in their zenith, Parker at the city temple and Spurgeon at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. It was fashionable for visitors in London to hear Parker on Sunday morning and Spurgeon at night. An American visitor followed this procedure. His morning comment was, my, what a wonderful oratory. His evening comment was, oh, what a wonderful Savior. With Spurgeon, it was Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all the time. Dr. F.B. Meyer used to say, in all real believers, Jesus is present. In some, he's not only present, but he's prominent. And in others, sadly, all too few, he's not only present and prominent, he's preeminent. Oh, that Christ be preeminent in each of us. May we learn to live in reliance on His Spirit and the power of His might. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word and we thank You for what You have brought to us and and we entrust to You entrust to you what what you need to say to each one of us. Lord, I ask that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, Lord, would today be the day of salvation for them? Would they come? Would they come to you? For those of you that, Lord, that are, are sons and daughters of the Most High, would you confirm and assure their hearts in you that they would go out in the control of the Spirit, that they would love this world. They would love you, love others. Heavenly Father, we pray these things and ask that you speak as only you can speak and preach as only you can preach through, in and by and through your Spirit. And God, it's, it's because of Jesus Christ that we can enter into this throne room and talk to you as our Father. We thank you for that. May you be magnified and glorified as we close in song and 
as we close in fellowship. It's in your name we pray. Amen.